So we continue with mastering pranayam where we left off and we left off last at we left off at Sandhya, I think that was what we did last, yes, in Mastering Pranayam. And now we are going to the next chapter. I mentioned this before, what you're seeing is the table of content from the forthcoming book by myself um, called Mastering Pranayam. And chapter 11 is about Kumbhak. So first briefly, what is Kumbhak? Kumbhak is suspension of breath, holding the breath. Unfortunately, Kumbhak has been misunderstood as well as abused by people from different styles and schools of yoga. Primarily, it has been practiced by a lot of very physical oriented forms or schools uh, practicing often some sort of gymnastics rather than really uh, yoga or any form of meditation. And then part of those gymnastic asanas, they include some sort of breathing exercises and one of these breathing exercises they include is kumbhak. And the form in which it is included is a very violent form of breath suspension. Why is it a violent form of breath suspension? Because it has not been well prepared. Without any form of preparation, when you go into Kumbhak, you can damage the pranic vehicles quite seriously. If the practitioner is not even having a good, natural, spontaneous, diaphragmatic breath, his entire pranic energy is blocked in different levels due to poor breathing, due to incorrect posture, due to uh, irregular breathing patterns or shallow breathing patterns. The effect of kumbhak can be quite devastating on the pranic vehicles and will cause far more harm and damage than benefit the practitioner. These forms of kumbha, which are extremely violent, I hope none of you are practicing it or you are not practicing it without any form of guidance because it certainly is something that requires good preparation. There are other dangers of practicing kumbhak when done without any preparation. And that is very long suspension of breath without preparation can cause permanent damage to the finer tissues of the lungs. Over and about this, it can seriously, I, I don't want to sound too dramatic, but it can cause uh, disturbances in really in the brain when you cut off the breath supply to the brain for an extended period of time. So unless you're fully prepared and gone through a systematic preparation with guidance, this is not advised. 
so much for the uh, cautionary note here because from now we are going into the more advanced pranayams and um, kumbhak being one of the more violent forms if done incorrectly it was important for me to emphasize this it's part of my responsibility so my guidance to everybody here will be if you're not sure don't do it if you don't have good guidance don't do it therefore you can take this session more as a session where you get some sort of background in it and work towards the preparation so the four kinds of kumbhaks are first is bhaya kumbhak bhaya means external the hindi word for example which is very similar as bahir outside external comes from bhaya which is sanskrit which means external what is external the breath is external the air you breathe out and then suspend therefore rechak and suspension exhalation and then suspension in effect you are suspending the breath with empty lungs your lungs are not filled but they are empty a bhayantra kumbhak is the opposite it is purak it is inhaling air and then suspending so it is internal you take in the air and then suspend so you are suspending the intake of air with full lungs after inhalation so these are mere technical descriptions of kumbhak third comes keval kumbhak now this is a real kumbhak in the sense that the first two were purely technical aspects where somebody tries to perform a practice but the third keval kumbhak is a suspension of breath which happens naturally on its own it happens spontaneously however you cannot maintain that suspension it may be for a few seconds maybe for a very short period of time some of you may have during the course of your pranayam practices have had an experience where you begin to feel that even the breath the very breath is beginning to disturb you and you have this feeling for just a few moments that the breath has stopped and for those few moments you feel like you've really gone deep inside have been totally internalized even the breath seems to have ceased just for a few moments that is an experience of keval kumbhak this experience may happen may occur if you have been practicing for a longer period of time diaphragmatic breathing or all the other simpler pranayam or breathing exercises better said any of the earlier breathing exercises that we have gone through or perhaps nadi shodnam sushumna kriya 
Some of these may have led naturally and spontaneously to Keval Kumbhak. Keval Kumbhak, however, as it says here, um, happens spontaneously. You cannot really control it. And it requires effort afterwards to maintain it. So after a while you feel, hmm, you can't hold it. You can't sustain it. And sustaining it with will requires effort which disturbs the meditation. And you come out of that bhava or the mood of meditation. So it leads the practitioner to a state of frustration is uh, the word that comes to me. A feeling that he comes to a certain point of the breathless state, close to the breathless state, but is not able to maintain it. It is an obstacle, one of the obstacles mentioned in the Yoga Sutras not being able to maintain a higher state of meditation. And that is what it is. But it is a good glimpse. It's a very good glimpse. And it is inviting us to go further, deeper. And the mind wrestles with this problem. How do we solve this problem? How do we stay in that breathless state? This brings us to the fourth kumbhak. And that is Keval kumbhak, but it is prepared. It's a level of mastery that is prepared. And Keval kumbhak in this form means reducing the number of breaths from an average of 15 times a minute to around one time a minute. If a person is breathing about two seconds in and two seconds out, or three seconds in and three seconds out, you calculate that, that comes to around 15 times in a minute. And so that's what the average person is doing, is breathing 15 times in a minute. But if you can bring down with all the breathing practices that we have done, especially equal breath, the very first, the most basic exercise, diaphragmatic breathing, equal breathing together. Then you can come down to one breath per minute. Imagine you are observing somebody in meditation and you have a very good observation power so you are able to see a person slowing down his breath for 15 times a minute down to one time a minute. What do you see? It appears then when a person is breathing only one time in a minute, one breath per minute, that the breath is so fine, so smooth, so gentle, so subtle, it seems that the person is almost not breathing. And this slowing down of the breath to one time a minute leads you to Keval Kumbhak. Good so far? Any questions? Hi. Mm -hmm. So so these are stuff. These are states that we are talking about during practice, I assume, or They're not stages. No, I mean these are all. Uh, these are all uh, like the fifteen one time a minute is is during practice. Yeah, 
So these people are not actually. Uh, so are there people who have reached a stage where actually you just me breathing one time a minute or? Yes, of course. Oh. It's not very difficult if you do it systematically. Okay, that's good to know. You sound surprised. It would be really nice. I mean, then you're like, well, then you're in a really, really healthy state. You're just breathing one time a minute. I don't mean that they're walking around breathing one time a minute. I mean, they can. they practice one time a minute. Yes. Okay. Okay. So they've they've got that kind of mastery that they can at will, whenever they want. Yeah. Believe me, Krishna, it's not so difficult. Oh, okay. So okay. So that's it's just a matter of having a systematic practice and a willpower which says I want to do it. That sense of urgency is what is generally missing for most people. Time flies past, you know. What we were just talking about before we started the meeting is that mm -hmm. very often we listen to these kind of discussions and think still somewhere unconsciously, oh, there are these people who can do it. Well, why can't you be one of them? Why are there these imaginary great people who have attained a level of mastery? In reality, it really doesn't take much to do that. You can do this in about three months, maximum six or seven months. If you do it really systematically, starting from scratch, six to seven months. But I know that most people are not going to do that. Six months, so which means, okay, which means the things that, well, I've been doing is kind of like not right because there's a lot of time I've spent on it and still going up and down. Do you remember when we did the earlier bit here, um, where was it again? Yes, we, we did this part here with Kapal Bhati and Bhastrika we had a table there and in that table there was a practice which took around six months, six to seven months. And if you observe that table and if you would have just followed that table alone, within six months you would have been at a stage where you could have done exactly this, reduced your breath from 15 times a minute to one per minute. And that too quite effortlessly. If it is done steadily over a period of time, it becomes really effortless. Okay, Let, let's not make this out to be some great unknown people somewhere, I can tell you that I can also do that. Reduce the breath to one breath per minute when I do my practice. It's not so difficult. Thanks. I think, yeah, I think the systematic thing is the key here. Yes. To be determined and be systematic. Yes. So what happens now when, uh, if I, may I continue or are there any more comments or questions to this? Uh, thanks, for me it's... No, I was referring to anybody else who might have something to say. Yes, Patricia asked, um, one breath a minute means inhalation plus exhalation. Yes, that's exactly right. That's a breath of 30 seconds in and 30 seconds out. And Shibu, absolutely right. 30 seconds equal breath. With diaphragmatic breathing. If you do that, you're heading towards Keval Kumbha.
Good observations from Patricia and from Shabun. <clears throat> so that's um, Pierre will come back now that we have demystified it. Leaves us now with what happens when you have one breath a minute and heading towards Kevil Kumbak. Which means at some point of time, if you can sustain that one breath per minute for a longer period of time, so perhaps you can do this for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, which means that in 10 or 15 minutes, you are breathing only, you know, 10 or 15 times. What's happening? The entire nervous system calms down. The pranic vehicle is really calm. You begin to see something shining through. The breath may completely stop. You're entering then the breathless state. If the breath completely stops, even for a few moments initially, you may experience a sense of fear. But if you go beyond the sense of fear, you get the deeper insights where you experience the wisdom within, pouring in, floodgates of wisdom open. One of the biggest issues that everybody has is breathless state. Oh, how is that possible for anybody to go to that breathless state? How can you hold the breathless state for a longer period of time? You attain the highest states of Samadhi and says you have to be in the breathless state for approximately from an external perspective for anything between 7 to 12 minutes. Internally, time stops. To the practitioner, he has no sense of time in the breathless state. So that is why Somebody who enters the breathless state and you ask him, how long were you there? He doesn't know. So which is why I clarify that to an external observer, it may appear like 7 to anywhere between 7 to 15 minutes. And to the, to the practitioner, time stands still. He's in timeless Realm. So, most people, of course, have a big problem with this. And the problem is, how is it possible for anybody who enters the breathless, st breathless state for such a long time, how can he come back out of that? For which, I have a diagram for you. Most of you may be familiar with this diagram. This is a very simple diagram of the koshas. This kosha, the first one, the physical body that we have, this in fact is a map of every individual. And the very first layer is the physical body. It's known as Anna Maya Kosha. So Anna, as we know, is food. And it encompasses not only the physical body, but everything around us as well. The entire world comes in this Kosha. Next comes the layer of energy, pranic layer. Then comes the layer of mind, Mano Maya Kosha. The fourth is the intuitive kosha, known as the Gyanaman kosha. It is where buddhi 
is resides. Very often people have translated this as intellect and uh, it always leads us to a feeling that this is something to do with reasoning and logic and therefore I have preferred to not use the word intellect instead using the word intuitive. Seriously the difficulty is finding a, a good uh, translation in English but um, that's the best that perhaps uh, I can think of. And the fifth is the Anandamaya Kosha or deep sleep where you experience consciously a sense of pure sattva. Every night we go to deep sleep but we are not conscious. And that's, that is more a tamasic state because you're not conscious. But if you go to deep sleep consciously, then you would experience a sattvic state of ananda, joy. And finally, the atman, the pure consciousness itself. And this process of going inwards, pravritti mag, is returning to the source going deeper then. If you just look at it with, without looking at the koshas, it appears, they appear to be like waves, you know, or ripples in water. But now imagine that you are standing here somewhere, you know, at this, where, where the word physical is written, and you are standing there. And this is a beach. Imagine you are at the beach and these are the waves that are coming. You know, you're the sea and there are these beautiful waves that keep coming regularly. Think of these waves as inhalation and exhalation. As you walk towards the sea, into the water, the waves, you experience them. You experience inhalation and exhalation, experiencing these waves that keep coming. As you go deeper into the water, what happens? You don't experience these waves so strong. The experience of the waves is more of the water moving like a body of water, you know, moves. It's not really a wave anymore. Now you're going further, deeper into the water, you know, until you are probably shoulders in the water. And the movement in the water has become still lesser. You have left the waves behind you. You're much deeper in the water and the waves behind you. Remember, the waves are inhalation and exhalation. So it's like breathing one breath a minute and no longer 15 breaths a minute. You left the 15 breaths a minute right behind there at the shore, at the, at the beach. And as you went deeper, the breaths were reducing. And now you're in the water and the water is right up to the shoulder. That's about one breath a minute. And there's movement. You see the body of water moving, but really not, not really a big movement. It's now just a body of water that's moving together. And now you prepare to dive in. You just dive into the water. Where has all the movement gone? Where's the inhalation, exhalation? It's disappeared. You're inside the water completely. When you're in the water, you don't experience anything that's on the surface. Right? That is Keval Kumbha. Now you're underwater, and if you were a fish, you could still breathe. Right? So, what is this water? This water is consciousness, it's life itself. That is the nature of consciousness. So what happens when you go take a dip in life? You do not die.
when you see that from this perspective, you see that actually what you're experiencing all the time here in this plane is almost like death. True life, experiencing pure consciousness, is really true life. And it makes us contemplate over the meaning of life and death. It would bring us then to that beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita where it says, for the yogi, what normal people think of as day is night. And for the yogi, what the others think of as night is day. Your perspective reverses. You see all this worldly activity happening at the seashore. That's interesting. But true life would be diving into pure consciousness and staying there. And you would experience that. Just like a fish is in its element in water. Fish does not drown in water. So also, when you take a dip in pure consciousness, you will not die. I guess that was quite an intense um, insights that you might um, perceive it as pretty intense and um, maybe something that you want to contemplate over. But if you do have some comments or questions, then you can go ahead. Okay, I guess that was that was quite intense and people are contemplating all of this. So we see this way that the koshas, these are the layers of the world. And as I explained, the beach, the waves coming, and you merge with prana itself and experience that kumbhak means diving into that ocean of consciousness and experiencing what eternal life means. And this is really kumbhak the samaya way. It comes through eliminating the pause. And that's what it meant when you go from 15 times a minute to one time a minute. You can do this practice by eliminating the pause, making your breath very fine, very gently. Many may experience some fear. If you just imagine yourself at the beach, walking into the sea. And if you are good at imagining, if you have a very vivid imagination, then you might even feel afraid as you are imagining yourself diving there into this water and staying there underwater. You might experience that fear and uh, that may happen initially. It's a matter of learning over time to overcome that fear. Because as I said, you are 
not going to die, you will in fact attain eternal life. But because we have created a habit over maybe not merely in years in this life, but also over many lifetimes, the habit that the moment you can't breathe, you panic, you think you're going to die. And so the idea that the breathless state can lead to eternal life seems to be so unreal or difficult for us to grasp. And if it is difficult, it doesn't matter. Just let it sit there. Okay, any questions about technical things, about kumbhak or uh, breath or about the koshas? Okay, I think everybody seems to be contemplating on this, which is always good. So this was uh, the chapter on Kumbhak, and the next is some pranayam practices. I have mentioned before the difference between breathing practices and pranayam practices. Breathing practices are those which involve inhalation, exhalation. They cannot be done mentally while pranayam practices are those that we also do mentally. And there is not necessarily breath involved in this. So some of the pranayam practices are Shavyatra, also known as 61 points. And um, Shittali Karna, Yoga Nidra. We will discuss whether Yoga Nidra is a technique or a state, and we will discuss whether Yoga Nidra is Pranayam or Atma Vichara or maybe something else altogether. And there is uh, Om Kriya. So these are some of the Pranayam practices. There are a few others which we have already covered. And the first one, Shavyatra. Shava means corpse. Yatra means journey. You are taking a journey through the corpse, that is your own body. It's also known as 61 points because you go through 61 points. And there is simplified version of this and that is known as general Shavasana. So Shavasana and Shavyatra are not different from each other. Shavasana is a more general practice which is done without points and Shavyatra is done with the 61 points. And it's not as if one is better than the other. Generally, Shavasana is done by those who, who cannot really focus very well, whose uh, level of concentration or ability to focus on certain points is not uh, very good. They cannot hold the points. And so a general form of it may be more appropriate. So it may seem here, hmm, these are just basic relaxation exercises. But I have mentioned before, we have done this. What is the difference between relaxation and pranayam? And we had talked about it in those earlier sessions where we said relaxation 
is not what most people consider relaxation to be. Uh, hanging out of the pool <laughs> or watching a movie, uh, that what most yoga studios call relaxation is in fact um, very much simplified versions of pranayama practices. And it's not about relaxing a few muscles. And that unfortunately is what has become of these practices. These are actually practices energizing the pranic vehicle. But what has happened is they are being oversimplified and used to relax the muscular system instead. And that was never the purpose. It was never intended for just relaxing the muscles. It was meant to energize the entire pranic vehicle and to remove toxins. Toxins are all forms and from the body. So in 61 points, that we can go through it, you lie on the floor on a not very not a very hard floor, but um, on a softer mat or even a thin, very thin mattress, have a, a good support for the head, a, a couple of thin shawls or a very thin pillow, just so that your head is supported. You should not feel cold. So if you have a colder room or living in Colder climates, you should cover your body, keep yourself warm, because with the pranayama practices in the initial stages, it appears that the body cools down. Once done correctly, that will not happen, but that may take some time till we get the ability to focus clearly on the points. So the relaxed body, arms apart, legs not completely apart but um, just a little bit apart. You lie there with your eyes closed and you allow your attention to rest at the forehead here between the eyebrows. This is not meant to be a, a complicated, difficult uh, concentration exercise. Therefore, I say allow your attention to rest there. Then it comes down to point two, which is here at the throat. There's a system in this, so you will find very easily that it goes from head to neck to this right hand, back to neck, then to left hand, back to neck, to chest, to the right, to the left, to the center, down, once again to the right leg, back up to the left leg, back up again and straight back to the forehead. So that is a very simply simple way of memorizing the points without having to look at this diagram. Obviously you cannot look at the diagram and, and do the practice. And so it is important that you memorize the order of the points. And you go through that from 2 to point 3, which is at the tip of the shoulder, to the elbow, and to each of the fingers, <clears throat> back to the elbow, to the shoulder, to the neck. Proceed similarly to the <clears throat> left arm, to the center, to the right breast, center, left breast, center, down to the perineum, then to the right, 
to the right knee, to the right ankle, to all the toes, and back up, to the left knee, to the left ankle, to all the toes, back up, to the perineum, to the navel, to the heart center, to the throat center, and finally, back to the forehead. You go through these points, you may experience initially nothing in particular. There are different versions of this. Some of the most complicated versions are with deities for the points, with special mantras for the points, and lights in different colors. And to these I say, yes, these are color practices. This is actually a um, Nyasa, it is called Nyasa practice. This is the Tantric practice. And this is a very fine Samaya version of this Tantric practice. Now, those of you who like to do complicated things will want to know all about the deities and the mantras and all these things. And that's not something that we recommend. As I said, these are practices done by many traditions. And uh, they actually take away from the main uh, idea. And the main idea behind the practice is merely to pay attention. And when you pay attention to a dark point in the body somewhere, one day, someday, you will see the light within the body. You will experience directly yourself the pranic channels, the nadis. You may be aware, some of you, that the yogis talk about there being 70,000 different nadis. We've always said that these are totally unimportant. What is more important is to focus purely on one nadi, which is Sushumna, the centralist canalis. But when you do this practice, you may start seeing that your entire body is nothing other than your consciousness. It is full of energy, full of prana, full of light. It is Shakti itself. If you do the practice with lights, with mantras, with deities, you will not see the real light. If you want to see the real light, the real energy, you need to sit in the dark. And so that is how Shaviyatra experience of a dead body can actually bring us to the experience of pure Shakti, pure life, pure consciousness. Questions about this? I'm pretty sure that some of you have done this or are doing this. It's a good point of time to clarify any doubts. Or if you have questions regarding the technique. Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the uh, how, what is the right amount of time to spend on each point? I mean, how do we know we have spent enough without <coughs> counting? 
story. Mm-hmm. There's no without such. preferably counting. <clears throat> There's no such thing as right time. You just do the practice, and when you find that you are too long at a certain point, and you start falling asleep, then it's time for you to move to the next point. Just make sure that you do not fall asleep. Now, Vishal mentions here, I was sleeping or falls asleep at a certain point. Is there a blockage or reason for this? Yes. Generally, if you fall asleep at a certain point or you just find your mind wandering off completely somewhere and then you realize, oops, after a really long time, that at point number four, for instance, every time you do it, you keep wandering off, that there is a certain blockage in the pranic channel. The solution is you keep doing it, make sure that now you're coming to point four, that you don't spend too much time there, you just move ahead, you just move ahead to point five. Important is don't fall asleep. So what is the ideal time to be at a point? There's nothing like ideal time or the right amount of time. You just have to make sure that you don't fall asleep. The tendency is that when you're lying flat, relaxed, and especially if you are in a colder climate and you've got your nice little blanket over it and you're really comfortable, then you tend to fall asleep. Therefore, also do this practice. And Mita has asked what's the best time to do the practice. The best time to do the practice is when you're not going to fall asleep. If you do this at night, after a long, tired, tiring day, it's extremely likely that you're going to fall asleep. So, do this practice preferably in the morning, when you have already slept, you know, you've got your seven, eight, nine hours of sleep, and you're most likely not going to fall asleep again. You're going to be awake. You're going to be wide awake. So... There is no other best time. You can do it actually any time if you want. Provided you're sure you're not going to fall asleep. So don't do it when you're tired. Do not use the practice to fall asleep. I know there are people who have said, because it, it, it happens very often, <laughs> those who don't get guidance, they use the practice very often fall asleep. So I know somebody who was doing this practice in bed because he said, oh, I I get very good sleep after that. And I say, no, never do it in bed because the bed is associated with sleep. And if you start using the practice to sleep, you're missing the point because this is not a practice to sleep. This is a practice to wake up, wake up from your ignorance, wake up to to true eternal life and not to get fall asleep in, in your tamas, in, in your ignorance. So never use this practice to fall asleep. Always make sure you snap out of it the moment you come to a point where you start feeling sleepy. Move to the next point, or if it is really that critical that you know you really cannot keep up, then end the practice there. Go through the body really fast and just end your practice. Never ever use this practice to fall asleep. Make sure that this does not become a habit because you're forming an extremely bad habit. A habit that will prevent your progress. Mita asked, uh, can you do it once a day? Oh yes, of course. It is one of the finest and the most subtle practices to do. And it really helps remove the blockages in the pranic vehicles. It really energizes. It um, has so many health benefits. And it is actually completely harmless. You can't do much wrong. 
For example, kumbhak requires a lot of preparation and if done incorrectly can cause harm. Well, the worst thing you can do with this is you fall asleep, you know. And so in that sense, uh, you would, uh, you know, you would not progress if you would use this to fall asleep or you would fall asleep all the time. But it is not in any way violent or harmful. So you can do this not only once a day, if you have the time and if you're inclined to, if you love it, you can do this more often. You can do it three, four times a day also if you want. There is absolutely no objection to that. For those who lead very, very busy lives, there is the possibility to do this also in the seated position. You can do this in the seated position, in, but in a more general way. You might find it very difficult to do this in a seated position with the points. It's, it just becomes a little bit more difficult to find the points. If you can do that, that's fine. Otherwise, you can do it in a more general way. It's like doing Shavasana in seated position. And the position then, if you do it in, while sitting, should be your posture of meditation. Whether it is uh, Sukhasana, Svastikasana, whatever your posture may be, you can also do it in a seated posture. The advantage of this is, you can do this also, for example, while traveling in the airplane, in trains. You know, when you're waiting somewhere for a long time for somebody like a waiting room, at a doctor's or a dentist. <laughs> and if you want, you can do this. As long as you are not in the driver's seat, for example, while driving a car, you can adapt this practice to also to seated position and you can also do it when you are outside. Of course, the true benefit of this practice comes most when you do it in the ideal position of lying down and um, in a quiet place with, um, when you're comfortable in a quiet room good air, not too, too much light outside. If you can darken your room a little bit, then that would be the ideal environment for doing this practice. So uh, amazing practice, 61 points or Shravyatra as it is known as, can um, not only give us health benefits, but it is also used for therapeutic practices of um, diagnosis. For those who are therapists or those who are have developed that sensitivity of um, prana, they can diagnose in, within themselves blockages of the pranic vehicle and also in others. Okay, so any more questions to Shav Yatra? Uh, Radhika Ji, this is Gautam here. Yeah. Uh, I have a question related to uh, Cable Kumbhak. So uh, is it okay if I can ask it now or uh, should I just... Uh... <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, no, I was actually being, you know, still stuck with uh, what you mentioned. So I was thinking uh, uh, when when we reduce the breaths from 15 to uh, one breath per minute. So is it uh, the breathing uh, happening uh, equally through both nostrils, or is it uh, still a single nostril breathing that uh, that's, uh, that can be done? Uh, what we were referring to uh, in the Samaya tradition, in our tradition, is breathing through both nostrils. There are traditions that have a far more complicated practices with breathing through one, breathing out to the other, etc. doing versions of 
Nadi Shodnam, also known as Anulom Vilom, and when they keep shifting the breath from one nostril to the other, that makes things much more complicated. And I, I have not found any advantage uh, in doing these complicated practices. It has been always, Samaya approach is simple and less practices you do, but go deeper. And um, that's when you get the most, you know, the most benefit and the greatest progress. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, if there are no more questions, no further questions, we can end this session here. We can, uh, we will be continuing our sessions then on uh, Friday with Bhagavad Gita. So, we see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.